we're at mosh pit 195 we've been getting together 194 times prior to this which is darn impressive and there's still more to talk about 195th mosh pit james waddell thank you for being here you've led us on half a dozen to 10 ai conversations last year what are we in for today uh today uh, we're going to be just generally trying to, to settle some some terminology differences across industries, things like BIM or digital twins, to level set a little bit on some just general understanding of where we are in the world of AI and as it relates to the built environment. If we think about AI in terms of an invention, one of the really good uh, analogies that I can think of is the invention of electricity. Uh, electricity was the genesis for those ideas and those innovations. and. And that's really where we are with AI right now. Uh, we're trying to back AI into use cases that we're familiar with. And yeah, there's certainly some advantages there, but I don't think we've even begun to have really, truly meaningful conversations on the impact that AI can have on us as a species uh, quite yet, because we just don't know what it can do as of yet. There might be more, you may have others, but these are the four really big things that I think are the challenges that we're facing in the built environment through 2030. Uh, decarbonization, dealing with obsolete buildings, uh, adapting to this whole new way of working, uh, sometimes it's called hybrid working, rescuing cities from the consequences of all three of those things. So think of AI as either predictive AI, as generative AI, or AI agents. And you can get some very, very good work results uh, from free or nearly free tools that are available to everyone. And, and you can go down through there and see if anything resonates with you, but fundamentally what he was attempting to show was based on free tools like property condition analysis, you can put in some, some basic information and get back some really good condition analysis reports uh, in the time that you say would be at least 40% as compared to doing it yourself with, with uh, manual analysis. Three services that OpenAI has, it's all built on their model. The first layer is the free one or the individual user where you pay for, for access. In both of those models, unless you uncheck, don't use my data for training, any, any interaction you have with the model is used to effectively train the model. So that information gets absorbed in the model and it becomes part of, of what it knows. The second layer is there's a there's a, a much lesser expensive version of OpenAI for teams. Within that, there are, are at least some uh, capabilities to where if you share information with that model, that version, that, that condensed sort of uh, walled off version for your teams, that it won't be shared with, with everyone using OpenAI. Uh, the third version is an enterprise scalable license, which basically is a a separate version of OpenAI for your enterprise, you're still fine tuning the OpenAI model when you when you deploy those in that way. And that's not something that we found uh, fits most scenarios, not certainly in the built environment. There's other ways to work with data and materials, uh, data and processes that don't require you to fine tune the model. A digital twin is in essence, a really smart building information model or BIM model. So it's a 3D representation of a space that has metadata or data associated with that space model. You can do predictive analytics, which we know is a type of a version of AI within that 3D model, right? So I, if uh, I might be able to do energy analysis using predictive AI, uh, using a digital twin. What we need to have a conversation about is and this is why it's hard to get data. A company doesn't want to give people access to their data because it's inside the firewall. We don't know what you're going to be doing with it. Like, holy cow, that's scary. It's like every single week or month, there's something new coming out. And it's just phenomenal to be, you know, on this journey and, and to, you know, speak to people like yourself and Nancy Slumbers and others that are kind of, you know, educating us on, on where we're heading. It's a very exciting time, scary and exciting at the same time. <laughs> A real data strategy for corporate real estate teams and the establishment of data governance, including, including data ownership and data stewardship. Because as Adam mentioned on the chat, garbage in, garbage out. Like if, if you can't um, certify that data and guarantee the validity of that data and make sure that your people can trust the data inside that independent data layer, 
then nobody's going to believe in anything that comes out of your AI models. The first is I'm very fascinated by how AI could work towards decarbonization of buildings. That's what it does to the environment. How can we help from the environment? Many, many use cases for that, that fundamentally you can use it for um, predictive analytics on, on uh, the type of material and how long it'll last in a building. You can track materiality in a building. Uh, you can use it to help people understand the recycling and repurpose and reuse of materials in a given building if you have the right data sets using generative AI to generate those reports and to help people understand.